Case Western Reserve University's Institute for the Science of Origins proudly presents the Origin Science Scholars Program. The Institute advances the scientific understanding and application of origins and evolution of human and natural systems. The Origin Science Scholars Lectures are presented with the assistance of Case Western Reserve University's Siegel Lifelong Learning Program, College of Arts and Sciences, and Media Vision. I'm delighted tonight to welcome Professor Ralph Harvey, Professor of Planetary Materials in the Department of Earth, Environmental and Planetary Sciences at Case Western Reserve University. Dr. Harvey is the Principal Investigator for the Antarctic Search for Meteorites Program with active research funding from NASA's Cosmochemistry and Mars Fundamental Research Program and NSF's Office of Polar Science Programs. Uh, he has an asteroid named after him, asteroid Ralph Harvey, and a cirque in Antarctica, Harvey Cirque. So, and tonight he's going to tell us about asteroids to protect and to swerve. Please welcome Dr. Ralph Harvey. Thank you. Um, to get started, let's talk about my relationship with asteroids. Um, my day job, as shown by the picture here, is I've been running the U.S. Antarctic Search for Meteorites for about 25 years now. Wow, it's a lot longer than I thought. And uh, uh, one of, uh, the logo up here, you probably can't read the fine print, but uh, one of our many logos we've, we've borne through the years is uh, protecting your planet since 1976. Um, imagine my surprise then when uh, in January of this year, I was told I was now a member, a founding member of the Planetary Defense Coordination Office, <laughs> a real live NASA entity uh, that has some uh, real reason to exist. Um, I'm way down on the org chart. I've uh, circled it there on ANSMET. Okay, so if you were expecting me to be wearing a badge or a uniform, uh, not going to happen. In fact, I'm, someone uh, joked that. Uh, you know, if, if the job of the Planetary Defense Coordination Office is to uh, keep track of stray dogs, I'm probably following around with a shovel. <laughs> so we're going to start with uh, the grade school view of asteroids that uh, you've all uh, been in inflicted with. Yes, the asteroids uh, are in a belt that lies between uh, Mars and Jupiter. Um, that's true. And we'll talk more about that, why it's there in a minute. Um, part of it that's not true, though, is that it is a constant hazard for navigation. Uh, the number of objects in that asteroid belt is indeed somewhere on the order of a billion, maybe more. Okay, But the actual volume of the asteroid belt is 6 billion billion square kilometers per object. Or cubic kilometers, so there's plenty of room. It is as much of space, mostly empty. So let's talk a little bit about what the asteroids are. Um, they are remnants from uh, the formation of the solar system primarily. There are a few that have evolved uh, a little bit more than that, and we'll talk about that. But our solar system formed from a disk, a spinning disk of gas and dust, and these asteroids represent a few bits and pieces that never got turned into a planet, never got flung away. And that latter aspect of things, things getting flung away, is a really important aspect of our solar system's history that a lot of people lose. Uh, first off, when the sun uh, first turned on its nuclear fusion as ga uh, gravity dragged gas and dust together, it started releasing energy in at least a thousand fold more than just gravitational collapse could do. So it's pretty much a hardly, barely contained explosion. In fact, uh, we see this stage in, in solar system development out there in stars we call Titauri stars. They often have big jets coming out uh, in polar directions, and those jets aren't some kind of ray gun. What they are is the only direction that stuff can escape from a disk. The disk itself is absorbing the remainder of that energy. Um, one of the things that's happening in that disk is stuff is melting, homogenizing, mixing up, and leaving. Probably at this stage, this sun turning on this vast nuclear furnace um, is blowing away about 90 to 99 percent of the stuff that was there to begin with. Shortly after that, as larger planets form, giant planets form, 
they start sweeping clear their lanes like uh, Zambonis on a highway, okay? Uh, and gradually what they do is uh, everything they encounter, they sweep up or fling away and they grow and grow and grow. I'm gonna show you a little uh, simulation of this, uh, a little movie here. And this is a simulation that starts with a population of about 10,000 little objects and a giant planet that's formed out further out in the disk. It's at about uh, six to five to six AU, that's five to six times the distance from the Earth. And as it spirals in, it grows by grabbing whatever it can from the disk. The rest of it, however, ends up getting flung away. What you can see is what you end up with is a giant planet very, very close to the, its parent star and very little else survives, okay? This is thought to be the standard procedure within newly forming solar systems and when we look out at exoplanets, etc., this is the most common case we see. Now this obviously doesn't match up with our solar system where we seem to have had a couple of decent sized giant planets develop and some intermediate things as well. And in fact, uh, a great deal of modeling has been done to figure out how this could happen. Uh, this slide kind of shows uh, from the top an earliest uh, solar system with uh, Jupiter and then Saturn and a couple of icy giants out there. Um, as Jupiter rolls in toward the sun sweeping stuff up, Saturn tries to follow it, they end up doing a little dance trying to come to equilibrium. If they get into a synchronous orbit where one goes around our new formed sun twice while the outer one goes around once, they tend to fling each other around. And in our solar system, because we had both uh, Jupiter and Saturn decently sized thing, this dance effectively clears out the solar system but preserves a few smaller objects closer in, objects like Venus and Earth and Mars and, and Mercury, uh, and leaves behind only a trace of those smaller bits that we call the asteroids in between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. So we're going to look more closely at the distribution of objects as they're seen today in that asteroid belt. And what we see, uh, you might expect kind of a smooth, almost kind of Gaussian or normal distribution of stuff, right? But that's not what you see. What you see is some big gaps. This is a messy little distribution. Um, you see some gaps here, some dashed lines that are labeled three to one, five to two, seven to three. These are places where an object that uh, orbits at that distance from the sun would feel a repeated tug of war for, between Jupiter and the sun. So at that three to one resonance, we call these resonances, an asteroid that got parked in that spot, every three times it went around the sun, Jupiter would be right back in the same place, pulling it away. The result is short lifetimes for objects that are close to these resonances. Anything that gets disturbed into one of these resonances either goes away, gets flung out of the solar system by Jupiter, or gets pretty much stopped in its orbit and it falls desperately toward the inner solar system. Um, this has been going on a long time. Jupiter and the Sun are the two big bullies and they have this tug of war going on. And as a result, we've got uh, a deeply bothered and perturbed asteroid belt. Now the stuff that falls down toward Earth uh, follows uh, orbital pathways, sometimes a little bit elliptical, and on this uh, slide all of those blue lines are known uh, near-Earth asteroids, asteroids that cross near to Earth. Um, there's a lot of them shown here. This is the, the total that the uh, Planetary Defense Office gave me uh, uh, as of uh, January, about 13,000 of them that are known. Uh, we'll see as we move on, there are probably a lot more. Um, these objects, of course, if, we're, if, if I'm lucky, uh, break up and little bits and pieces of them make it to Earth. And uh, so uh, I now hereby claim that I collect the nearest of the near-Earth uh, asteroids myself. That's my day job. Um, and we can talk about meteorites later if you want. Uh, suffice it to say that these are uh, a ground truth uh, sample, if you will, of what the asteroids are made of. They tell us about their mineralogy and their chemical makeup and some of their physical properties as well. But I want to move back to the objects that are still in space and talk more about the asteroids. And one of the key things we're going to need to talk about if we want to understand them as a potential threat 
is how many there are and how we might count them. This turns out to be pretty difficult because they are really, really hard to see. Um, they typically are moving against the starry background, but they are very, very faint. And as we'll see in a few minutes, they're very, very dark and they're very, very small. It really is a needle in a hair, haystack uh, kind of search. Uh, we have an idea how many there ought to be, particularly as we get to the smaller sizes. It turns out the observable big asteroids follow what's called a power law. It's a size distribution where you have just a few big things and a whole lot of little things. In fact, it follows a power law that we call a, a, a power law of two. Sometimes it's two to two and a half. It's somewhere in that ballpark. But what that means is that um, if you have 10, 10 kilometer sized objects, you will have uh, 100 times that of one kilometer sized objects. They go up as an exponent of two. That makes the little ones really, really difficult to count and probably very, very numerous. Um, this is more of a schematic way of looking at it. And those question marks at the bottom here are very real. When we get down to sizes that are really, really hard to observe, and in this case, these are uh, the, the observable ones are, are nicely colored uh, tan, uh, and the green ones are somewhat, we've seen them once and lost them. Uh, when we get down to the kind of 100 meter scale, they're really, really hard to see. And we don't really know how many are there. Let's talk a little bit about what we know about asteroids by going to visit them. We've seen uh, and visited about a dozen asteroids with missions. Most of these just kind of fly by. And the really big ones, uh, the one on the, on the left here is Ceres and next to it is Vesta. Uh, Ceres about a, a, a thousand kilometers across. Really looks like a planet in a lot of ways. I'm not going to open that debate. Vesta is a little lumpier, but uh, about half that size. Let's look at the smaller stuff, though, because that's what we know may be potential Earth crossers in general uh, in the box. And if we zoom in there a little bit, what we start to see is they get lumpier and lumpier, uh, more broken looking, more like shards, more like bits of, of gravel. And uh, I'm going to show you something else, too. I'm going to uh, ratio the brightness on these correctly for you uh, so that they're as your eye would see them. And if we do that, I want you to notice quite a few of them go away. There's a lot of asteroids that have a brightness that's about the same as a charcoal briquette. So it makes them very, very hard to see. Now we're going to zoom in on that little square on this one real quickly and visit Itakawa, which was visited by the Hayabusa spacecraft uh, several years ago. And by the time we get down here, we're talking microgravity, OK? We're talking if you drop a rock on Itakawa, it takes a couple hours to fall a centimeter. Okay, uh, These things really do look like uh, flying gravel lots. And we're not sure if Itakawa really is a whole lot of dust bunny here, or gravel bunny, uh, or a couple of bigger blocks with pieces in between them. And that's a really important thing to know when we think about the history of these. Here's another really interesting thing when we look at these very small ones. A lot of them look like they're starting to distort into a frisbee shape, and they spin very, very fast. When you get down to things that are about 100, uh, well, excuse me, a, a few tens of kilometers across down to a few hundred meters across, a lot of them have this strong equatorial bulge. And when we look at them in radar, what we see is this. They're spinning strongly on their axis. This, uh, this one, uh, 1999 KW4, has a little moon. And doesn't it look like that moon is just a droplet spun off of a, a body that's behaving almost like a, a granular liquid? That may be, in fact, what's going on, because there's something called the Yorp effect, where sunlight pushing on an irregular object will catch the irregularities like a sail and start to spin that little object around. It's not only catching photons, but it's radiating off thermal energy, and it really gets spun up. And we have seen this happen. If this will go, I'm sorry for the ESA advertisement. Uh, we've actually been fortunate enough to see an asteroid break up this way. Um, so it's fair to say we don't know a lot about these small asteroids, but what we do know is starting to scare us, that if we consider these bullets aimed at our tidy little blue planet, 
there may be a lot more bullets out there than we think, and they may be breaking up a little bit on their way to us, making more and more. Non-scientist question, if it's larger than X or smaller than X, it's not an asteroid, what is larger than and what is smaller than? You know, there's no real size definition of what an asteroid is. It's, it's a very loose definition. There is this, uh, you know, when a rock hits the Earth, we call it a meteorite. When it goes flashing by through the Earth's atmosphere, we call it a meteor. When it's a relatively small body in space, we often call it an asteroid. But there's new definitions for what is a planetoid, a dwarf planet, a planet, etc. I can't keep up with it. Um, suffice it to say that we typically call them asteroids if they are in the asteroid belt or, or inside. There are some asteroids that are near Jupiter. We'll actually talk about uh, in a little while, briefly. Um, but the definition is still very, very fluid. In fact, there are some people who take umbrage at calling Ceres an asteroid. It's in the middle of the asteroid belt, but clearly it's under the influence of, of gravity and acting like a planet. So why not call it a dwarf planet? And that was part of the Pluto issue. Let's not go there. <laughs> When you show that one graph where there were null points, where there was nothing, is that how the, um, obviously that's the physics, is that the physics of like Saturn and Jupiter and the rings around it? And no, that's something else. You're, you're asking if it's the equivalent of the gaps in Saturn's right. thing. Um, not really. In Saturn's rings, as I understand it, and I'm not a Saturn expert, um, there's all sorts of little moons embedded in those rings that are doing a lot of that shepherding. And some of the things that were originally seen telescopically as gaps aren't really gaps at all. They're just uh, uh, thinly veiled traps for oncoming spacecraft. The spinning caused by the uh, impingement of photons from the sun, I didn't understand. I understand how that impingement would happen, but why wouldn't the reverse impingement happen 180 degrees later? The reason is that uh, there's two things going on there, not just one. And if you have, um, imagine you have a kind of a spherical object, and you, let's, let's literally imagine we've got a rock like a sail on one side of it. Uh, even if it's kind of tumbling, okay, that is getting extra illumination, and it's, it's getting extra warmth, and it's radiating out infrared photons. So you've got visible light photons bouncing off it, infrared photons being absorbed on that same side, and then infrared photons being thrown out. And this guy, Yarkovsky, who is the first name in the York process, was the one to realize that for these little objects that don't have a lot of mass, those, those infrared photons that it throw out matter in terms of momentum. They really have enough mass to mess this balance up. Uh, there's also no drag. So once you get down there, and they're not exactly sure of the limit, but it seems to be down there around 250 meters across, this YORP effect not only takes the object and starts it spinning so that the sail is in the, in, you know, like a long axis, but it accelerates all the way up. Whether it comes apart or not, uh, that question still, I mean, it looks like it happens. We're seeing evidence it happens. Um, but it's going to involve how cohesive the thing is. Okay, if it's a big solid brick, it probably has to spin up a lot more than if it's a loose dust bunny kind of thing. And in fact, we're going to talk a little bit about this problem of cohesion because it is the one thing we really haven't ever measured for asteroids. Okay, if it's a sticky mess, it's much less likely to kind of spall things off as it spins and distort it all, right, uh, than if it's a loose fluffy mess. So, yeah, it's a little bit counterintuitive, but hey, it works. And in fact, this guy Yarkovsky uh, predicted this almost 100 years ago. It's amazing. Would asteroids still combine with each other or anything else? That's a great question. Um, it's, it's certainly possible for them to combine if their relative velocities are pretty low, okay? At this stage in the solar system's history, um, relative velocities are almost always going to be high unless uh, the two objects originated together somehow because space is pretty empty. Um, so moving from one thing to the other uh, around in big empty space, they almost always must have some relative velocity that's pretty high even to get together.
Okay, so that's the problem. In the early days of the solar system, that was not so much an issue. There were a lot of things kind of orbiting together with similar uh, velocities, and therefore, when they make contact or whatever, it causes trouble, but it doesn't blow everything all to heck. Nowadays, it's more likely to blow it to heck. That said, they also note that if you take one of these little fluffy things and spin pieces off, uh, this is an area where they could come back together. And there are certain models that suggest there's a sweet spot, and I don't know exactly where it is, where they come apart and they come back together. And they come apart and they come back together. And they lose a little mass over time, and over 20, 30 million years, they go away. They kind of evaporate. Thank you for joining us. You've been watching Dr. Ralph Harvey telling us all about asteroids. For more information on the Origins Science Scholars Program, please visit the Institute's website at origins.case.edu. In the next part of the talk, Dr. Harvey will tell us how asteroids can pose a threat to Earth. Now, back to the talk. Let's talk about threats. And uh, I'm going to hit you right where your pocketbook is, you know? Those of you who care about science and those of you who are scientists know the scariest question you can get is, why are we spending all our tax dollars on this science when there's so many problems at home? An asteroid hitting the Earth is a problem at home. <laughs> it's a really big problem, okay? Just ask the dinosaurs, okay? So let's talk about how we're dealing with this uh, how NASA is dealing with this, and a lot of this, a lot of the slides you're going to see come out of presentations that the Planetary Defense uh, Coordination Center uh, provided to me in my newfound position. Let's talk, let's talk history a little bit. Um, one of the defining events in the history of our, our concern about uh, the threat of asteroids was Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9, which was uh, discovered and then shortly afterwards discovered to have come apart into pieces, and shortly thereafter discovered was going to hit Jupiter. And they figured out the timing and the date of it. And uh, telescopes all around the world of every different type watched as this comet made Earth-sized holes in the atmosphere of Jupiter. That was enough. And uh, by the mid-90s, uh, some different entities were starting to evolve. Space Guard, uh, was one in our uh, in uh, that NASA played a role in. Uh, I love the the motto. You can't really see it very well, but the Latin motto here for Space Guard is neither with confidence nor without hope. <laughs> in 1998, Congress decided that they had to take control of this and basically said, "Okay, NASA, you're going to find at least 90 percent." of the near-Earth objects bigger than a kilometer across, and started to support programs to do the searches that that would require. By the mid-2000s, in fact, uh, they felt strongly enough about it to make it part of NASA's mission statement. So I was very pleased to find out that I was now going to be funded by an office that wasn't just a good idea, it was the law. <laughs> so I'm going to let this run in the background. I hope it runs. It's a little mesmerizing. Please don't uh, get hip hypnotized. Um, the number of asteroid discoveries, of course, went way, way up. And uh, this, every little dot here that's lighting up is a new asteroid discover discovery. This is running through time. Uh, by the mid-2000s, uh, there were a lot of different uh, search missions that were underway. And uh, when this thing is done running, it will have found 65,000 meteorite uh, asteroids uh, plus. You might also note there's a little cloud of little red buggers all around the orbit of the Earth. Uh, do not be alarmed at this time. Uh, they're colored red to show you they're going by Earth, and the fact that it's a little cloud is just because they're really easy to see <laughs> when they get close. One other thing to notice is that they all are looking outward from the Earth, and that's because they're hard to see. You can't look toward the sun and expect to see a dim little object. So pretty much all the asteroid searches are very tightly constrained in terms of geometry. You're always looking away from the sun uh, and looking basically out, outwards that way. The next major event to kind of uh, color our, our local perceptions of the threat was just a few years ago in February of 2013, the, the, the explosion of a meteor over Chelyabinsk, uh, Russia, which didn't kill anybody 
uh, but it did a lot of damage and uh, injured a lot of people, mostly with flying glass. Um, this thing exploded at 23 kilometers of altitude, way, way up. And uh, basically the explosion was about as powerful as the bomb dropped on Hiroshima, about uh, 30 kilotons. Uh, the object that blew up at that height was about 17 meters across, not very big, that central little thing here. But because it was traveling at close to 20 kilometers a second, when it hit the Earth's atmosphere, it pretty much came apart very explosively. Here's the thing you may not know. These aren't very rare. <laughs> kiloton level or tens of kiloton level events are not uncommon. Maybe several every few years, okay? Uh, most of them happen over uninhabited areas of the, the world. Most of them happen at night. Uh, the good news is, or excuse me, any time during the day, it's kind of randomly distributed, uh, both geographically and by time. The good news is, is that uh, after 50, 60 odd years of Cold War, we're really good at detecting explosions that were uh, of that kind of energy. So we've pretty much mapped them out, and we know they happen. Um, it's just a matter of time before something like that makes it down to Earth. Chelyabinsk got the international community. Uh, involved and a lot of new uh, networks and centers and conferences uh, were born. The Planetary Defense Coordination Office was a part of this uh, that, that formed this January. Now I'm going to show you uh, a graph here. This is a little bit busy, but bear with me. Um, this is a graph that the Planetary Defense Office uses to talk about its mission. And uh, the green bars along the bottom are the known asteroids that have been found. Uh, the blue kind of sinusoidal curve there running uh, from uh, kind of lower left to upper right is uh, the number of uh, how complete the survey is. And the red line kind of running from the upper left to the lower right is the expected population of objects. So this purple triangle shows you the things we think are there but we've never seen, how many there might be. Now I want you to notice the background labeling too. Some of the really small ones, we think uh, they don't offer much in terms of devastation. We're not going to worry too much about them. But by the time you get to things the size of the Chelyablinsk uh, impact, you're talking about things that if they hit could take away a city. And you don't have to get much bigger just into the order of things that are instead of, uh, instead of 20 meters across or 100 meters across, you're talking about things that take away a country. It is a serious threat, and there's a lot of them we don't know are out there. That's a good prompting to start surveys, and uh, the uh, NASA's uh, Near Earth Object Observation Program is uh, getting some good boosts of funding. There's orbital camera, NEOWISE, there's a whole bunch of ground-based cameras. There is a lot of uh, survey work and searching work going on here in very sophisticated ways. Um, they are developing procedures as well. You find, that, find something is going to uh, potentially be a hazard. We call these PHA, potentially hazardous asteroids. Um, who do you talk to first? When do you decide to tell the president? My favorite part of this, which is in the fine print here, is the head of NASA finds out before the president. And so if he starts selling property, you know you should do the same. Something, if something is found, of course, we want to characterize it better, particularly if it starts to look like it might be a threat. And there are a lot of facilities that uh, can help us out there. Radar is particularly useful. It has to be pretty close. An object has to be close to be imaged with radar. But it gives us really good, almost real-time uh, views of the, of, of the object in question. Infrared telescopes are great, um, very sensitive for finding things that are a little bit warmer than the space around them. Uh, you know, you can't see them with visible light because they're a charcoal briquette, but you can see the warmth that they've absorbed. Um, and there is even a space telescope that's helping out with this. Finally, um, what do you do if you decide there's a problem? If you've got a lot of uh, uh, warning, several missions have been developed to try and figure out how to nudge this thing out of the way. We're going to talk about one of those missions uh, uh, when we talk about gravity tractors. There's also the concept of let's fly a motor up there, strap it on there, and try and push it just like we'd push a rocket. Okay? But you need some serious warning to do that. 
How about if you don't have much warning? Okay, can you throw something heavy at it and knock it kinetically out of its orbit? Okay, and then finally, of course, as every, well, not every, but a lot of movies have told us, when do you get out the nukes? When do you try and blow it to smithereens? That's obviously a serious consideration, and so another part of the formalization of all of this is to figure out the, the, how, to, how to assess the threat. What information do you need? Okay. Finally, I'll note something that I find absolutely amazing is uh, there are a number of exercises going on at planetary defense conferences. This one that I'm, I'm calling out here took place uh, about a year ago, and uh, they basically had uh, about 200 attendees from all over the world, and they put them in a scenario. And over a period of four days, they said, okay, we've just discovered a new asteroid. There's a 1% chance it'll hit the Earth. What do you guys think about it? What do you need to know? And then the next day, they said, oh, we've improved the models. It's a 45% chance of it hitting the Earth. The next day, it was 90 and the next day, they knew it was going to come down somewhere either in the Indonesian Pacific or the Indian subcontinent. And the idea was, of course, to try and model, well, how should we respond? And there were people playing the roles of, of government leaders, people playing the roles of troublemakers on the internet, whatever you might imagine. And it was all very, very realistic. I know several of the people who attended that were astonished how they couldn't sleep at night worrying about this. Um, and of course, there was a lot of uh, geeky scientists there who very quantitatively measured things like casualties in the tens of millions, okay? But the real eye-opener was that many, many people didn't know how to react, okay? Uh, I've been told two things that came out of it that they found utterly fascinating. One was how many people wanted to help. The number of people that wanted to just kind of run away from the problem was very, very low, okay? But in the age of instantaneous communication, uh, and this was uh, in this scenario, it was set to fall in September of 2016 uh, in Bangladesh. There were people who were claiming it's a plot by the people running for president in the U.S. trying to stir up votes, okay? Think about that for a minute. I mean, we need some understanding, not just of the science and the mechanics behind this, but how are people going to respond? And is information going to be controlled? Does it need to? You ask yourself, is it an act of God? Good question. There are a lot of these uh, kind of conferences coming up. If you hear about them and you're interested in this topic, go sign up. I don't care what you do for a living, go sign up and give your opinion. They'd love to have you. Um, the next one coming up is, uh, where is it? It's shown up here. It's uh, in the Pacific, and they're going to be modeling uh, uh, the tsunami impact scenario, which could be very, very def devastating. In fact, they're going to do that again in 2017 in a meeting in Japan, which is a place that really knows about disaster preparedness. Okay. So as we get into the next uh, question break, I'll just leave you with that, that thought that, the, sure, this is a very serious natural disaster. You know, as, at this stage in our civilization, we've never really dealt with a natural disaster with potentially tens of millions or more casualties. But is it a preventable one? Is it the first of these that we have a way out of, potentially? Besides the uh, wiping out the dinosaurs, was there any other uh, historical evidence of large-scale events? I'll give you a, uh, the, the answer is uh, yes and no, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, there's no question that the extinction at the boundary between the Cretaceous and the tertiary eras on Earth was also the place of a giant impact. But even today, there are people that say there was more to that extinction, that it was also a time of enhanced volcanism, ocean turnovers because of sulfur and carbon dioxide, a lot of things going on, okay? Um, 
we don't really have any records, if we want to put it on human scales, we don't really have any record of anybody being killed by a meteorite. There's been lots of great sensationalist claims. Uh, I have a little folder somewhere full of paper clippings from the 1880s, you know, the era, the great era of newspapers trying to outsell each other, you know, where it says, John Jones on his farm in Iowa was found with a smoking hole in his chest, and it went <laughs> all the way to the basement. And uh, it, this has been going on for a long time. There's actually some great ancient Chinese records, a Chinese grad student compiled in the early 2000s, where he found that in the earliest tax records in China over 2,000 years ago, the emperor would be told by the tax collectors, you know, that the village of Wushan was now gone. It had been destroyed by a rain of fire from the heavens. And there's no evidence it really happened. So what probably happened was the mayor of Wushan said, I'll give you 20 bucks, we're gone. <laughs> And it happened once, and then it happened more often. So <laughs> I, think, I think that's uh, pretty, pretty good evidence. Speaking about the object that uh, purportedly was part of the problem with getting rid of the uh, dinosaurs, I just read recently that they may have actually uh, dug down to parts of that meteor. Do you know anything about that? I know there, there is a, a newly uh, funded effort to drill right through it and really understand the size of the crater, the depth of the crater, etc. You know, so far it's kind of speculative. We see kind of signs of surface rocks that are broken up, uh, but the real size of the impactor still isn't really known. There's tsunami deposits along all along the Gulf Coast, and there's airborne debris that you, and charcoal layers you can find all over the place. And of course, this iridium layer, which would be finely disseminated, presumably bits of the, the, the projectile itself. But yeah, there is a new project underway, an international project to drill through that uh, crater all the way to bedrock and really understand kind of the size and the scale of it, because it's, it's a little speculative. I'd like to go back to like the end of the first section and the beginning of the second. Uh, how good are we really at telling the difference between comets and, uh, you know, spent comets and asteroids? For example, it is possible for a comet to be pushed towards the inner solar system by Jupiter, trapped in an orbit, have the volatiles, you know, cooked out of it. Absolutely. I mean, the, the, defini the, the distinction between asteroids and comets and uh, anything else you want to throw in there is, 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 is a blurry one. There are clearly some objects that we call asteroids that are outgassing, um, events that have been seen to happen. Uh, comets, of course, I haven't really talked about. They're a threat that's really hard to gauge because they often are one-time passers-by in our early solar system and coming from any angle. They're usually not in the ecliptic plane. So they are a part of this threat, too. Um, uh, we have some idea of what they're made of, you know, that they're water ice and, and uh, probably more like dirty snow than uh, anything else. But even there, we're, we're just, the door, the door to understanding them is, is just now opening. So um, that's part, they're, they're looking for comets too, as they look for potentially hazardous asteroids. They're looking for any small object. And sometimes they call them, that's why they call them near Earth objects instead of comets. The catch is, is that they, they're so unpredictable uh, that uh, you know, you've got to continuously look for those. Whereas for a lot of these asteroidal objects, you can find them, calculate an orbit for them, and say, we don't have to look at this one again for 200 years. That'll never be the case with a comet. In, in one of your early slides, you had an abbreviation KYR as a parameter. Can you tell us what that is? I think that was 1,000 years, K-Y-R, kilo years. But I can make up whatever you want. <laughs> it, it was astronomical units along the bottom, and K-Y-R was a parameter. I think it's kilo years, and there was also M-Y-R for million years. That was somebody else's slide. I would have spelled it out. <laughs> Hi. Uh, last week, Glenn gave a talk at the Happy Dog and he had these slides of, of like old Euclid Beach things that twirl and, and little cages, you know, and they go like this. And he was talking about how they don't spin off. But now I have that image stuck with your Zamboni comment. 
about sweeping up things. And can you explain what you mean by Zamboni sweeping up things and try to link it to my image of Glenn's Euclid Beach ride? What you learn from Glenn, I cannot explain to any human being. <laughs> Uh, but I can try and clarify a little bit. You know, uh, uh, gravity is a very powerful force, and uh, the bigger an object gets as things are colliding at low relative velocity, very quickly it starts gr growing more and more and more. It's like a pile of food out, and the big dog's going to be the one to get bigger, and the little dogs aren't going to get any. Okay? Um, in the case of uh, a giant planet forming, the place they're typically going to start forming is in the outer lanes of this big disk of gas and dust. Why? Because their path is full of stuff and their path is longer. So they grow quickly bigger. But every collision it has with the loose gas and dust is generally slowing it down a little bit rather than speeding it up. Okay? The snowplow goes slower when there's more snow in the way. And what happens when you slow an object down in an orbit is it starts to spiral in. And while it's spiraling in, it's collecting more and more stuff and getting bigger and bigger and bigger. When people first started seeing exoplanets, they marveled at the fact that almost every one they found was a big, big Jupiter, maybe 10, 12, even 20 times as big as Jupiter, orbiting right next to its parent star. And uh, all the theorists who had been studying planet formation said, of course, that's exactly what ought to happen. Uh, the turnaround, though, was everybody turned around and looked at our own solar system and said, well, why the heck didn't it happen here? Um, and that's why all this modeling came along. What they realized was in our solar system, instead of uh, kind of one big dog gobbling up the food, another one showed up and was big enough so they competed with each other. And so one would spiral in, the other would stay a little out, but then the one that was out there would pull that one back out, and they'd even switch places at times. The end result was kind of a chaotic dance that cleared out the solar system before they could grow much further. Okay? And that allowed some of the little dogs to get fatter in close to the sun. That's a horrible analogy. I've got dogs on the mind. Uh, I hope that helps. We hope you've been enjoying the Origin Science Scholars Program with Dr. Ralph Harvey. For 30 years, Dr. Harvey has been the principal investigator of the Antarctic Search for Meteors, and thereby a member of NASA's Planetary Defense Coordination Office. In the second part of our talk, we learned about asteroids hitting the Earth. In our final segment, Dr. Harvey will discuss how we might hope to prevent asteroids from hitting the Earth. Now, back to our talk. Having just brought you all down to death and gloom and destruction, let me try and raise you up a little bit with a few more things that uh, are going on to try and understand these asteroids. Um, missions to asteroids aren't anything particularly new. Uh, most of the missions that have occurred so far have been flybys. Let's take a look. And they've all been uh, very, very interesting. Uh, on a couple of occasions, we've been fortunate enough to have object, uh, spacecraft park next to an asteroid and examine them. Um, uh, we saw a picture of the asteroid Itakawa a while ago in the Japanese uh, Hayabusa mission parked right next to it. Very uh, small, kind of 500-meter uh, object, learned a lot from that. And of course, ongoing right now is the Dawn mission that's orbiting the big asteroid or planetoid or dwarf planet series. Uh, after having done the same at Vesta a few years ago. So we're learning a lot about these bigger objects. Um, for reasons of planetary defense, smaller objects are getting a lot more attention too. Um, one of the missions that's coming up is uh, a redo of Hayabusa. Hayabusa had some, uh, Hayabusa 1 had some real issues that the Japanese overcame. And they were very eager to do it again and do it right this time. So indeed, that's what they're doing. They're going to a very small, very dark asteroid called uh, Ryugu. Hayabusa was launched uh, several years ago and uh, actually just flew by Christmas time, flew back by Earth on its way to its target. Uh, this time, it's got uh, uh, a sampling probe there. You can see it kind of looks like a musket. That's because it is a musket. <laughs> they put that thing gently lower that musket against the surface of the asteroid, fire a beryllium ball out of it, and then try to catch what comes out back up the barrel. Okay. It also has a couple of little rovers uh, and a little lander that hops around. 
Um, and in fact, when they do this little musket thing, they're gonna try and do it in a fresh area that they already hit with a bowling ball sized impactor to kind of dig deeper a little bit. Um, it's not all about figuring out what's there. It's also, they wanna see what happens when you hit it with a bowling ball. Uh, because we don't know if this is a dust bunny or a brick with a thin coating, okay? Uh, and then it's gonna grab the stuff in the musket barrel and bring it home to look at um, in about 2020. The US has a, a much more ambitious asteroid sample return uh, coming up. This spacecraft is being put together right now for launch in just a few months. And uh, it's called OSIRIS-REx, uh, and it is gonna do a lot of the same things that Hayabusa does, but it's gonna do it the good old American way, real high resolution imagery and science with a sample return coming back uh, in 2023. In terms of missions designed to really explore planetary defense, uh, the elephant in the room is a mission called the Asteroid Redirect Mission, or ARM. Uh, there are scientists out there in the planetary world that really hate this mission because this was one that NASA said, we have to do, it's the law. And the scientists said, well, we didn't prioritize it. And then they said, Congress told us we have to do it. I think it's a pretty cool mission. An original design was actually to go out and grab a small asteroid and drag it back and put it in orbit around the moon where we could study it in detail. And the whole object, the idea of capturing it and dragging it around, we learn a lot about its physical processes and stuff, and we'd have it there for as long as we want to study. Uh, they downsized that a little bit about a year ago, and now it's, uh, they're gonna grab a boulder only from a mission. And uh, I've, as I've told Patricia, I cannot look at this uh, spacecraft with its legs and its little grippers and not imagine it going, eh, 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 <laughs> trying to lift this thing up. Uh, but in fact, it is a very serious mission. Um, they are designing the arms right now. They have a giant fake plastic asteroid to practice on. Uh, one of the things it's going to do is it is uh, gonna pick up this boulder and then it's gonna move a little bit away and it's gonna try a very, very clever way of making an asteroid uh, change course. If you think about it, what it's done is, is it's taken the spacecraft and really, really increased its mass to the point where it's like a moon of this little asteroid. But it's a moon with a little engine on it. And so by carefully, carefully driving that spacecraft around, the gravitational pull between the two allows you to pull the original parent asteroid out of its course. So ARM is actually testing that hypothesis that if we know early enough, we can change the course of a potentially hazardous object. When it's all done, it just says bye-bye and it goes back to Earth orbit and astronauts and whoever else wants to can go up there and uh, have a look at it, learn more about its physical properties. It's a pretty amazing mission. It's being developed very rapidly. Um, and uh, I, I, for one, am really looking forward to see how it all goes. Uh, about every 10 years, NASA uh, tries to choose a discovery mission. The scientists try to choose this for NASA. And in fact, in the last competition, uh, the five finalists that were named last year, three of the five finalists were asteroid related. One is a, a mission called the Awesome Psyche Mission. Uh, sounds like something born in a teenager's mind. Um, Psyche is a metal asteroid, the remnant of a core of a larger body that's been heavily disrupted. Um, and so that's a lot of the coolness of that uh, mission. Uh, NEOCAM is a very, very sophisticated orbital camera. It's in Earth orbit, but it's designed totally to just look for asteroids. It has a thermal infrared camera that can see just a glimmer of heat against the background of space. And they're gonna park it at the L1 site between uh, the Earth and the Sun. So it's got a nice view backwards into the, uh, it's got the biggest view that you could probably get. Um, there's a joint mission uh, with the European Space Mission called AIDA which consists of two pieces, a piece called AIM, which is the thing in the, in, the, in the lower right. It's basically a very fancy camera and a bunch of analytical device. And uh, the part the US is making is called DART. 
and I bet you can figure out what DART's going to do. This is uh, going to visit a binary asteroid called Didymos, and DART is going to drive over the speed limit right into its moon and see if it can move it and see what it does. Sounds simple, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, going to the smaller scale, the little objects that we don't know how many are out there and we really, really, really want to know about them, whether they're tumbling, whether they're strong, how many of them are there, we have some very, very small, very inexpensive missions that are being uh, chosen uh, for uh, development. This is one that's basically almost certain to get launched called uh, NEA Scout, Near Earth Asteroid Scout. It's something about two times the size of a shoebox that is a pow it has a solar sail to kind of steer it around amongst the near Earth asteroids. A very, very long, very, very slow mission, but with lots of little near Earth asteroids it can go visit. Here's one I'm very proud of because I know the science team leader really well and he's an awesome guy. You should hear him talk sometime. Um, <clears throat> it's uh, the David mission. This thing is even smaller. This thing is really about the size of a boot box. Um, uh, basically, this is very tightly cost constrained. Uh, its method of launch is pretty simple. It's going to be kicked out the door of a test of uh, the space launch system. Literally, an astronaut's just going to go boop. And then we drive ourselves to an asteroid and hope that we can take a picture of it as we fly by very, very quickly. Um, uh, one of the things you have to do if you're on a space mission is uh, formally accept all the protocols NASA has for releasing the data within a very sophisticated set of formats and a system called the Planetary Data System. And when they asked us questions about this as they were reviewing the proposal, they said, well, what is, what is your plan for releasing your data? At which time we confessed that all of the data we collect could be emailed to everyone on Earth and it would be well under a, a megabyte. <laughs> they didn't think it was as funny as you did. <laughs> um, here's another project I'm involved with that's going on out, out at NASA Glenn. Uh, this project is to understand that problem with how cohesive this stuff is. How sticky is it? Okay, we measure that stuff in the lab and this, this is basically just a vacuum chamber that's almost at space vacuum with a piano wire holding a bar that acts like a little balance. And we take the balance, uh, we put a plate of meteorite stuff on, on the end of the arm and we take a pin of meteorite stuff and we just go push, gently and slowly push. And then we pull it back, if the arm comes back past the neutral position, we see a little wiggle which is that what you see in that graph there. And that wiggle has to be how sticky it was, okay? No one's ever done that. That's a piece of data that is really critical to understanding whether you can pull a boulder off something. Uh, the other ways it's, it's, well, yeah, that's one of the reasons it's critical. It's also critical for human exploration. We don't know if this stuff is gonna stick to suits, stick to your lungs, stick to your astronaut ice cream, okay? We don't know if it's going to stick to solar panels and whether you could get it off with a little bit of an electrostatic charge. Uh, and then finally, as we were talking about before, you know, this cohesive or adhesive force within asteroids is really a critical variable to understand how they distort, how they might come apart. Uh, right now, there's three orders of magnitude just in guesses alone in trying to establish this value. So I'm going to close with uh, just two slides. Uh, this is just to remind you not, not to go the way of the dinosaurs. And in this case, though, I'm happy if this asteroid takes out the Toronto Raptors. Um, the last thing is an advertisement. This is not an advertisement for me, but this is something I just stumbled on as I was preparing this talk. Did, how many of you knew that in six weeks we'll all be celebrating Asteroid Day? Okay. This actually is part of the worldwide effort to get people more in tune with uh, not only uh, the risks involved with asteroids, but the fact we can do something about it if, if, if we uh, share information and if we uh, work together. Um, the date was chosen because it's the date of the big Tunguska uh, explosion in Siberia in 1908 that a lot of people think was a meteor blowing up and, and causing pretty much devastation and probably killing 100 squirrels or more. Um, and with that, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you for your attention.
The Origin Science Scholars Lectures are presented by Case Western Reserve University's Institute for the Science of Origins, with the assistance of the Siegel Lifelong Learning Program, the College of Arts and Sciences, and Media Vision. For more information on the Origin Science Scholars Program, including a full video archive, please visit the Institute's website at origins.case.edu.